Something big is going on in the market and we need to talk about it. Tech stocks are rallying and everything else is selling and the bifurcated market is not a healthy market. So the question we have to answer today is will the rest of the market catch up or will tech stocks falter? Today we answer that question and also talk about the health of the economy precious metals and what exactly is driving S&P 500 returns. Is it multiple growth? Is it earnings growth? And can it continue? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. We had an extremely bifurcated day of trade here. The obvious winners were technology, semiconductors, and software. And it's just that these names are running into Nvidia's earnings and just running into some software earnings we have this week. And that's why we saw software really, really upbeat. Same with semiconductors, Microsoft, Apple, and Google also all participated. However, financials took it on the chin today because JP Morgan was down 4.1% on hints that Jamie Dimon might be retiring a little bit early. And that's obviously gonna wane on investor confidence. Netflix put up a 3.1% day, very, very weird. Didn't really see any news as to why that was. Maybe I missed something right there. And then Target was down 2.2%. It came out and said it was gonna slash a bunch of prices on essential items. And you know, what does that say about the consumer? What does that say about sales? They report on Wednesday and that had a tangible effect on consumer defensive stocks. Eli Lilly was up 1.4%. There was a little bit of news. Hims and her health came out and said they were gonna start offering GLP-1 drugs and that's gonna be upbeat for stocks like Eli Lilly. But you know, it was a very, very mixed day today. So, you know, we had semiconductors, technology, software here at the top, look at XLC as well. And then GDX, XME, you know, also, you know, being the best performing stocks for the day. Obviously, semiconductors completely outperformed. It's just the leader in the market. The leader's always gonna run, especially when you have the number one stock in the market leader reporting on Wednesday. We are gonna talk about this type of trade. We're seeing technology and commodities in a very weird trade. It's actually what fund managers are buying. And we, and we talk a bit about it later in the video when it comes to fund manager positioning and why that's happening and why that's going to continue. And then every other sector just underperformed the SPY. In fact, were actually negative on the day, including financials, regional banks, discretionary staples, real estate, energy, home construction, healthcare, and utilities so a very mixed day a very bifurcated day here in the market so before we dive into the s p 500 let's have a look at what we did here on the day so the s p 500 was pretty much flat same too with the rsp and mid caps you know they were up 0.1.09 percent pretty much flat for the day the nasdaq 100 was up 0.7 percent again technology semiconductor software if they rally the nasdaq 100 is going to rally and then the dow jones was down 0.49 percent and that had to do with just healthcare being in the dumps today, as well as financials. JP Morgan not really participating in the broad-based rally, and that did affect the Dow Jones. And yields did increase, that did have a damper on stocks. It's part of the reason why we actually saw quite a bit of selling action here on the day. You know, yields did increase the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year across the curve. Bitcoin actually up 5%, and it looks like the breakout is alive and well here in Bitcoin. So we were making lower lows. We then actually put in a higher low, broke above this trend line, consolidated for a bit, and now we're actually moving higher. And it does look like we're breaking key levels here in Bitcoin, and that probably means we will go higher. I mean, up here 5% for the day, very, very constructive. And you know, the next uh, key levels that, if you're a Bitcoin bull, you really wanna see Bitcoin take, it's probably that level right there, 71,500. You go ahead and break that, and you're looking at all-time highs here in Bitcoin. Looking very constructive, uh, just for higher price action, in Bitcoin, very, very strong price action right here. That was also supported by gold, gold hitting a new all-time high, a wick high, and actually another closing all-time high. Silver up 0.92%, again, outperforming gold, and actually quite a lot of volatility. A lot of silver bears came in here at the top, took silver lower, nonetheless, still bullish. That is a closing high. The dollar did gain, and again, you know, with, rate, with rates moving up, dollar moving up, that's just gonna affect overall a sentiment in the market overall price action the algos look at that i think it's probably time to sell and that's why we did see the action we did in the s p 500 on the five minute chart i mean we did see a rally here in the early hours trade but then we formed we put a top in and then it was actually downhill and we pretty much closed where we opened for the day now looking at the daily chart zooming in right now this is a, a new wick high here in the s p 500 so that is constructive 
but it does look like we're seeing a bit of selling pressure here at the 5300 area we've had the last three days of just sideways movement after we had this massive bullish candle here after the cpi news and that is very very telling now the call gamma resistance did move up to 5400 so we would expect to buy dip sell rips to that number but do understand we are in the window of weakness so from now until the end of May, dealer supporter flows are not quite there and they start to make their way back into the market. Those Vanna and Charm flows start to come back into the market towards the end of May. So if we do see a bit of sideways action, maybe even a little bit of a pullback, you know, to the 5250, maybe even as low as the 5200 area, don't be surprised by that. We are in the window of weakness. It's to be expected. And just, you know, sit through the volatility, buy those dips because higher prices are going to ensue. We had a bunch of firms uh, reiterate price targets, 5,500, 5,600 over the last week, a couple more today. And that's just gonna further support sentiment and price action to the upside. Now for the rest of the week, the call down resistance is at 5,400. So ultimately we do wanna buy dips, sell rips to that figure. 5,400 is our ultimate target into the June OPEX. And what we do wanna look for is strategic buying opportunities. And I think if we do dip uh, to 50, uh, 250, that should be the first area that you really want to add exposure uh, looking for again you know the 5400 area you know if we do, if we do get in here at the 5250 that would be a 150 point run into the june opex that's very very good especially if you're a trader you know let's say you're trading at 20 dollars per point you're going to make a very very healthy profit just you know in a single month on those trades so you know you do want to uh, look to, to buy the 5250 area and then move higher. I really don't think we're gonna go lower unless we have some major, major news on the macro front. I think the earnings front is is fine. Earnings are coming better than expected. The only thing that can deter this market right now is just the macro front. If anything comes in bad on the macro, that is gonna affect the overall market. But other than that, business as usual, buy dips, sell rips, look to 5,400 towards June OPEX. Now guys, I got some very, very interesting data for you guys. This is S&P 500 performance after we make a 12 month high in May or a new 52 week high in May. And it's essentially the return uh, that we can expect from June all the way into December. So pretty much for the rest of the year or come June. And the results are very, very positive. So we're just gonna look at this right here, the June to December return. Now we've had 27 instances when this has happened, 23 of them have seen positive returns in that seven month period, four losses, average return 7.58%, median return 8.3%. So very positive returns here. And we can actually see that normally we actually do get a negative June, negative 0.2%. It's very, very mixed here in June, 15 wins, 12 losses. And actually the data remains quite mixed even into July, August, and September. It really only starts to favor the bulls here in October, 19 wins, eight losses, 20 and seven for both November and December. Average returns for the last three months of the year all above 1.5 percent 1.66 percent average return 2.26 average percent return in november 1.42 percent in december so essentially what this data is telling us is that we should expect higher price action through the end of december but come june we should expect a little bit of volatility and we should actually expect choppiness into the november period where we will see most of the gains come in the october november and december time period now let's dive into some stats about this earnings season. This is how the market has rewarded earnings beats versus earnings misses. And it's been quite a hectic earnings season. I mean, earnings is coming in good. We're sitting at 7.8% uh, earnings per share growth here for the S&P 500. At the start of earnings season, we were expecting 3.5%. But you can see in this upbeat earnings momentum, earnings beats have actually been punished. This is median excess returns versus the S&P 500 on a day after the earnings reports. And you can see that earnings beats have actually been punished by 18 basis points. So pretty much, let's say the S&P 500 moved 50 basis points to the upside, the company reported earnings, beat earnings, they would have only returned 32 basis points in return on that day. However, if you missed earnings, if the S&P 500 was up 1%, if you missed earnings, that stock was down 0.26% for that day. So very, very interesting stuff right here. Both beats and misses have been punished and that just 
goes to show that at the start of this earnings season, the S&P 500 was trading at very, very lofty valuations. And we are kind of getting there as well, at least in the S&P 500, not so much in the RSP and maybe the smaller name, the smaller cap stocks, mid cap stocks, but we definitely are getting back to those lofty valuations in the S&P 500. But with earnings season past us and earnings coming in very, very good, that does mean we can go higher to actually get to the relative same value as it was pre the start of this earnings season. Now, with that being said, where can you find value in this market? This is the old economy versus the new economy, and it's essentially relative valuation metrics, price to free cash flow, price to earnings next 12 months, EV to EBITDA, and then price to book ratio of the new economy, this dark blue, which is tech, discretionary, and comm services versus old economy, which is energy, materials, and industrials. And you can see in every single instance, price to free cash flow or price to book, the old economy stocks are quite undervalued on a relative basis. Now, that doesn't mean that the stock is cheap on an absolute basis. It's just saying in comparison to this, in comparison to the new economy, you know, industrial stocks, material stocks, energy stocks are trading at quite a deep discount. And so if you do want to start looking at value or maybe growth at a reasonable price, maybe start, yeah, starting the material sector, starting the industrial sector, starting the energy sector, you know, look at gold miners, look at commodities. That's where you would look at to find value in this market because stuff like tech, discretionary and comm services trading at very, very high multiples. Look, price to free cash flow 30 times. Absolutely crazy. You know, you're probably looking at a free cash flow yield here of probably closer to 2% versus this right here, which is probably anywhere from three to four, maybe even upward of 4%. Now, with that being said, what are fund managers doing and are people buying equities? Now, last week we had $12.35 billion in equity fund flows. You can actually see this is the second week of gains coming off the previous three weeks which were fairly lackluster and fairly volatile to the upside and downside. But we did see quite a bit of equity fund flows. And I do expect this to continue, especially if the S&P 500 continues to the upside. Now, what are fund managers buying? Excluding ETFs, the biggest sector that fund managers are buying is comm services, then materials, then technology, then real estate. Below that, it's very, very mixed. And then we actually saw outflows in stuff like healthcare, utilities, staples, industrials, and consumer discretionary. And fund manager positioning is very, very clear. They are rotating from these sectors, discretionary, industrial, staples, healthcare, utilities, and they are positioning into comm services and technology, which is pretty much growth, but also keeping exposure to commodities via materials. The bulk of material inflows probably has to do with gold miners as well as silver miners because they have been on quite the rally. And we do know that gold during rate cutting cycles tends to do very, very well. Once the Fed pauses and then cuts, gold goes on magnificent rallies. 66% here in the early 2000s, 189% in 2008. Here in 2020 during COVID, gold went on a 50% rally. And now this is where we are right now. Gold is sort of flatlining, making all time highs. The Fed is set to pause come the end of the year, it may be September, it may be December, but it likely means that gold is probably going to rally quite significantly. We've seen silver take off already, and I do think gold is to follow. Now let's talk a bit about the S&P 500 and the correction we've seen. This is some very interesting data here from 314 Research. This is the S&P 500 when we've had a pullback greater than 4% that turned into 10% corrections and then the retracement to the highs before the 10% decline. So essentially, so essentially what this is looking at is, you know, when the S&P 500 has moved down 4%, right? So this is a 4% pullback and then when it's gone to a further 10%. Now this right here is when it's actually retraced from the 10% mark. So it hasn't quite hit the 10% and then gone to make a new high. And we can actually see that 60% of all corrections go down without a retracement. So essentially what this is telling us is that 60% of the time or 61% of the time, when we get a 4% pullback, it doesn't actually go to a 10% pullback, which is very, very interesting. And we see three to 4% here is actually at 22%. 3 to 2 percent, negative 3 percent to negative 2 percent is 10 percent. And then we actually see an uptick here. So this is the inflection number. And 12 percent of the time, we see a 2 to 1 percent correction turn into a 10 percent correction. And then only 17 percent of the time does a 1 percent correction turn into a 10 percent correction. So very, very interesting data right here. And that is why I say Every time we normally get a 5% correction in the S&P 500, you do want to load up at every 5% intervals because most of the time, that's about all you're going to get in the S&P 500 unless there's a major downturn or a major pullback. And something else you need to know, the average S&P 500 bear market is 23%. So if you buy every 5% pullback, right, 
you're going to have four major buys. So he had 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. You're going to have four major areas to load up on. Let's say you only get a 15% pullback, then you would have three instead. So generally speaking, when we do get a 5% pullback, like we did uh, most recently in April in the S&P 500, guys, you want to buy and you want to load up. I'm not saying load the absolute boat, but you do want to add exposure in a very big way because the more likely outcome is that we go back to the highs. 60% of the time, we go back to those highs versus going down another 6% in the S&P 500. And that's because history always favors above average returns. This is the distribution of five-year S&P 500 returns. 29% of the time, the S&P 500 returns 14 to 20%. 10% of the time greater than 20%. So you could say 14 to 20% plus, almost 40%, 39% of the time does the S&P 500 return 14 to 20% plus returns. Then we have 10 to 14% of the time is 18%, 4 to 10% is actually 18%. Only 12% of the time does the S&P 500 report return less than 4% to 0% returns and less than 0%. So all in all, guys, generally speaking, we do get above average returns. The S&P 500 average is about 9 to 10%. And most of the time, we do actually get outsized returns in the S&P 500. The reason why we have this figure is because we do get bear markets. We do get significant pullbacks uh, in the stock markets as a whole. And volatility is the price you pay for excess market returns. Now, looking at the S&P 500 in the last year, we've seen substantial growth this year, the S&P 500 is up about 12% so far this year, and it's mostly been driven by margins. So this right here is the S&P 500 before earnings season. And this right here is the S&P 500 after earnings season. And essentially the total return drivers in the S&P 500. And we can actually see that sales growth only accounted for 1.7% before the earnings season. It's now up 2.5%. So that's earnings expansion, not multiple expansion. We can see that margin growth 1.4% versus 2.8%, right? And then multiple growth actually contracted. 7.1% of S&P 500 returns was actually multiple driven returns before earnings season. After this earnings season, on the 15th of the 5th, we actually saw this actually decrease, multiple growth decrease, margin expansion increase, sales growth increase, and we actually saw a slight increase here in dividends as well. And that's because S&P 500 is reporting margins at 13%. This is some of the highest margins we've ever seen since mid-2022 when the government dumped $1.7 trillion into the economy right here. So you know, this is very organic margin expansion here in the S&P 500. And it's actually part of the reason why we're seeing the rally right now. Multiples are actually contracting. The S&P 500 is getting cheaper. And this is an earnings driven rally where we're seeing this earnings season. Now, let's talk a bit about the economy. Now, this right here is the latest edition of the Carson LEI, the leading index. I prefer this over the actual leading index just because it favors more components of the economy and is less weighted to stuff like the yield curve and manufacturing surveys and looks at factors like real consumption over surveys. And it continues to move higher and it continues to tell us that the economy is in good nick. At the same time, we're actually seeing financial conditions ease in the overall financial market. And that's a really, really good thing. We did have a little bit of a scare here, you know, at the start of the year, financial conditions did increase quite significantly, but we've actually seen that pull back to very close to the early March early January levels we saw here at the start of 2024. And that has actually supported part of the rally. And that's why we're seeing um, stuff like the Russell 2000 and mid cap also gain quite a bit since the start of May. Now, at the same time, economic surprise index, what supported this rally towards the end of 2023 into 2024 was the fact that data did surprise to the upside in a very, very big way. We got better than expected employment data. Inflation data came in a little bit hotter than expected. Retail sales came in better than expected. And that did support the overall economy. Sure, it did affect rate cut expectations. But at the end of the day, the economy is remaining strong. And that's why we saw these positive upward surprises. Since about April, May, we've actually seen the data soften substantially. That probably means the rate cuts are starting to be felt by the market. And we've actually seen negative data surprises. Now, this is really good because things were getting a little bit hot right here. But what we do want to see is that these negative surprises to moderate. We want to see data come more in line, maybe a little bit of positive data, just so that things don't go from bad to absolutely terrible. At the same time, the U.S. labor market, very, very resilient. As long as the labor market stays intact, everything will come as a result. And we can actually see 
that the labor market has dipped below the four week moving average for sure. This is initial jobless claims, however, still very, very healthy and still at historically low levels, all things considered. Looking at stuff like inflation though, this is a very, very interesting chart. So this is inflation from 1943 to 1949. Take this with a grain of salt. It's very specific data. You can see that at the end of World War II, we had a huge uptick uh, in inflation, right? Then the Fed started hiking rates and inflation came down quite significantly up until a point right here where the Fed paused and then inflation data went sideways. We saw the very similar thing after COVID. This right here was COVID. We then saw a huge upward momentum in inflation, the cost of living crisis, and then huge amounts of disinflation after rate hikes. And now we're at the pause phase. What happened in 19... 49 was that we actually continued to see inflation move to the downside and hopefully we do see that as well if this continues that's going to be supportive for equity markets especially if the economy continues to have a strong labor market now part of the reason why we could actually see this disinflation has to actually do with the components of cpi the biggest contributors to cpi right now actually is housing along with auto insurance so shelter and auto insurance and we do know that oer is set to disinflate significantly as well as auto insurance and if that is the case we will see cpi uh, move to the downside and that will affect the overall inflation picture the rate cut picture and that is going to be good for stocks especially if the labor market continues to be strong so if we can see you know strong labor market strong consumption while disinflation happens in cpi in pce in ppi that is going to be the, the soft landing, no landing scenario. And then you will see markets go to highs you never thought possible. Now, guys, looking at gamma, big changes have occurred after this OPEX. So we've seen quite a lot of negative gamma coming to the tape. So a lot of traders and investors hedging their portfolios as we are at 5,300. But the more important thing is that the 5,400 strike is now the core resistance. We've moved up the tape from 5,300 to 5,400. This is bullish. This means speculators and investors, people who buy options, expect more upside because they rolled up their position that'll make the market go higher up to 5,400. They expect more upside. This is exactly what I said would happen. I said, we're going to stay at 5,300 into the May OPEX. Once all of this rolls off the tape, we are either going to stay at the 5,300 or move up to the 5,400. Those were my two scenarios. We've moved up the tape and this means we buy dip sell rips to the 5,400 strike into the June OPEX. We do have to get through this window of weakness. And I do think we are still probably going to trend sideways. There's a ton of gamma strikes right here at the 5325, 5350 level. And that's probably going to keep us pinned between the 5300 to the 5350 level into the end of May. But into the June OPEX, there's no doubt in my mind that we're probably going to go and get this 5400 strike, especially with the limited amount of negative gamma here in the tape. The 5195 is still the gamma flip zone. So until we actually get below the 5195 level, this level right here, Okay, I would not be looking at shorts in the market. I would just be looking at dip buying opportunities. And look at all this massive, massive um, positive gamma in the tape, guys. We are in a bull market. Things are even more bullish with a 5,400 call resistance. Buy dip, sell rips all the way to 5,400. If you see pullbacks, look at it as minor dip buying opportunities. The path of least resistance is higher. Now, let's quickly talk about earnings in the week ahead. So today we had Palo Alto, Zoom, Trip.com. Very average earnings, if you ask me. Then we, tomorrow, we don't have much of anything. Mostly just Lowe's, Lacey's, AutoZones. That's the big ones. We do have XPeng as well right there. And Wednesday, we have Target, TJ Maxx, as well as NVIDIA, Snowflake, Elf, Synopsis. That's going to be a very big day of earnings here on Wednesday, especially with NVIDIA reporting. And Thursday, Ralph Lauren, Decker Brands, Intuit, Workday. So, you know, really, it's just like Wednesday, Thursday. Those are the big days. We're going to be paying attention to on earnings, but particularly NVIDIA, particularly Snowflake here on Wednesday. Data in the week ahead, guys. So we got FOMC minutes later this week. We also got initial jobless claims and then durable goods orders. These are the expectations, the consensus, both as estimates and what it was previously. You guys can just pause the video right here if you want to have a look at them. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.